I'm a cellist who studies acoustics. And today, musicians and scientists are often separated and unrelated. Now, I believe there's a benefit to be gained by bridging music and the scientific study of it. So today, I'm going to be talking about an experiment of mine that explores the relationship between performer and instrument. Now, that relationship is exceedingly complex with cognitive and physical processes we have only begun to understand. But before I get into the science of it, let's first consider a process that most every musician of Western classical music has to undergo, playing in an orchestra. So maybe you're an orchestral musician or you've played in orchestras, but if not, just pretend for a moment. There you are in a practice room, listening to your sound, adjusting it. Probably being overcritical but getting it just right. Now, imagine you're in an orchestra where you're playing in a section of 10 to 15 others, where you're encouraged to blend your sounds together so you can't necessarily hear what you're playing. to all of that hard work from the practice room when you can hear the sound of the whole, but not necessarily your own. Maybe a lot of things. Scientists have looked at frequency and rhythmic errors, they've looked at note accuracy, how many notes a musician will tend to get wrong when he can't hear himself, and those show that um, musicians play a little bit more inaccurately, not much, but just a little when, they're, when they can't hear themselves, when their auditory feedback is removed. But what I'm interested in isn't a question of accuracy, but rather of aesthetics. How does timbre change when a musician can't hear himself? Now, what is timbre? Timbre is synonymous with sound quality. It's everything you hear in a sound besides its pitch and its loudness. Now, timbre is deeply rooted in physics. When you excite an instrument, either by drawing the bow across the string or by pushing air through it, if it's a wind or a brass instrument, you set it to vibration, and it vibrates at many different rates. We call the strongest rates of vibration harmonics. And it's the relationship between these harmonics and the prominence of one harmonic over the next that determines the timbre of the sound. So if you take a look, here's the harmonic strengths of a few different instruments, the oboe, the trumpet, and the violin, where you can see the oboe sound is characterized by a particularly strong fourth harmonic, and the violin has a little bit more of an even spectrum, even weight to the relative harmonic strengths. So in music, these relative harmonic strengths are like the fingerprint of the sound. It's how you tell the difference between a guitar and a flute. So, are there differences in the timbre of the sound of an instrumentalist when he can't hear himself versus when he can? To test this, I had cellists come into a lab that I work in on Central Campus. I was um, graciously given a space in a cosmology lab to work in the physics building, so the researchers, I think, must have gotten a kick out of me doing my work, because I bring in cellists and they spend most of their time mapping out galaxy clusters, doing something entirely different. Um, but so the cellists came into my lab and they played under a couple different conditions when they could and could not hear themselves. Now, I'm a cellist, so let's do the experiment. Um, before I start, though, one thing that was very important to me in designing the experiment was that I choose music that the musicians would get excited about. A lot of studies on music are relatively dense, um, or they use exercises that the musicians can play, but not necessarily make music with. So I picked excerpts from the orchestral literature, ones that cellists typically have to use when they're auditioning for professional orchestras. I picked the second movement soli section of Brahms Symphony No. 2, which is a famous cello soli section, <laughs> and the second movement of Beethoven Symphony No. 5, another famous cello soli section. And I know that my cellists were excited to play it um, because it's beautiful music. I've heard it now probably four or 500 times, and I still like it. So for the sake of time today, I'm just going to play the Beethoven. Here it is. So 
So they repeated that a bunch of times. And then we were faced with the challenge of removing their hearing. Now, how do you take away someone's hearing? We gave them 32 decibel reduction earplugs, noise-canceling headphones, and then we streamed pink noise, which is similar to white noise, except it's a little bit easier on your ears through the headphones at the loudest possible decibel level that the Occupational Safety and Health Association would allow us, <laughs> which is 80 decibels. So here's what the pink noise sounded like. When I put these headphones on and I turn the noise on, I probably won't be able to hear anything other than my own voice, and even that will be muffled. So I'll play the excerpt again. At this point, we've succeeded in creating a very controlled lab experiment, but under what conditions really do cellists play with headphones on, with noise streaming into their ears? We needed something that would connect with the cellist most organically. And fortunately, our University Symphony Orchestra here at the music school had played both of these excerpts in concerts earlier this year, and they gave us access to those recordings. So we had the cellists play along with their own performances, best simulating what seemed like playing in an orchestra. And even though during the experiment the cellists played with the headphones on, we're going to play it over the loudspeaker today so you all can enjoy the recording too. Um, you'll hear a two-beat metronome click in, and that was just so the cellists knew when to start to play. So here's the Beethoven again. <laughs> At the end of the survey, the cellists were asked to, or at the end of the experiment, the cellists were asked to complete a survey um, where one of the questions they were asked was whether or not they felt orchestral playing required a different kind of sound than solo playing. And they all answered yes, that they felt they needed to play differently when they played in orchestra when they play alone. Now, I know I'm not supposed to do this because technically the study isn't over and you're not supposed to share preliminary data before it's published, but here's a compilation of all of the instrumentalist sounds who participated in the experiment under the three different conditions. These are the relative harmonic strengths that you saw before. Where you can see the first condition is when they heard themselves, the second condition is when they were playing pink noise through the headphones, and the third condition was when they played with, long, with their own orchestral recordings. And there are some small differences in the fourth and fifth harmonic strengths, but for the most part, the timbre stayed pretty much the same. So what might the implications of this be? Maybe it's that we reach a point in our musical training where the music becomes so ingrained in our bodies that we don't necessarily need to hear what we're doing. Our auditory feedback isn't quite as necessary as we might have thought. And there's historical evidence for these kinds of vibrational interactions with the music. Well, the cellist had also given me auditory um, in informal feedback at the end of the experiment, where they were saying that they felt a connection with the instrument when their auditory feedback is removed, that they could be sensitive to the vibrations of the instrument and allow the vibrations to guide them in making the music that they want. We've seen this kind of thing before. Um, Beethoven had cut the legs off of his piano and put the piano on the ground as he grew deaf later in life so he could feel the vibrations of the instrument. Um, Evelyn Glennie, who lost her hearing at a young age, is a world-famous percussionist now, and if you haven't seen her TED Talk on online, um, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's really fantastic. She talks about how she plays the instrument really just by touch. The fact that my cellists, after just a 10 or a 15-minute experiment, could reach that same conclusion, that they can use the instrument's vibrations to make the music, um, I thought it was amazing. 
And it led me to believe that we can all have a very multi-sensory connection with music. So this study looked at music through a scientific lens. And I feel very proud that I've created something that I think both the scientific and musical communities are interested in. So not unlike the players in an orchestra that have to blend their sounds together and work together to make the result that they want. I think that science and music make a great ensemble. And it's my hope that we can move forward together and let the vibrations of the music guide us. Thank you. <laughs>